webinar for with McGraw-Hill Exchange. I'm so excited to be with you today to talk about one of my favorite tools, Google. And we're going to be chatting with you today about how to Googleize your school. Woohoo! My name is Jenny McGarra, and my Twitter handle is at Miss McGarra. You can see on the bottom of the screen. Um, and I am a digital learning coordinator for a network of 25 Chicago public schools called the Academy for Urban School Leadership. CPS just went Google this summer, double woohoo, and our network also has an additional Google Apps for Education, or GAFE, domain as well. With me, I have a special guest star, a fellow Google certified teacher and all around awesome lady, Miss Danielle. Danielle, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Danielle, and uh, my Twitter handle, and I swear I wasn't copy copying Jenny, is at Ms. Phyllis, F-I-L-A-S, and uh, as Jenny said, I'm a Google Certified Teacher, and I'm at Village Academy Schools in Powell, Ohio, and uh, we just got googly last year, so we've been uh, fully Google for a whole year, and we're loving it. So today I am going to be taking you through 10 awesome tips to Googleize your school and Danielle and I are going to chat about them. She's going to share how they do it at their school um, and we really want to encourage you to please share your thoughts and questions in the chat question box um, so that we can try and make this hour-long webinar as helpful to you as humanly possible. So I am going to be going back and forth between this presentation screen and um, my Google browser. And actually, I'm probably going to spend more time here um, with it in a smaller in a smaller window than in the full window so that we can go back and forth more easily. If for whatever reason you cannot, um, you cannot see the screen, please let me know. Um, I noticed that Carol and Linda, uh, maybe Linda can't hear anything. I'm going to type back and say, yes, you, you should. Um, but if you have any other um, technical issues, please let us know so that you don't miss out. All right. So the first uh, thing we want to chat with you today about is Google Forms for assessments. Uh, Google Forms, if you haven't discovered them yet, are really easy, to tool, easy tools that you can find in your Google Drive um, that can be used for a myriad of options. So we're going to take you to it for just a minute. So the first thing you want to do is go to your Google Drive. If you've never been here before, you can type in drive.google.com. Or if you're signed into any Google app, you'll see it in the black nav bar at the top of your screen. Um, once you're there, you want to click on this big red Create button. And then you want to click on Form, which is at the bottom. Then you get into this really nice uh, edit box. Now, Google Forms was just updated a few weeks ago, um, actually a little over a month ago now. So for those of you who've used Google Forms in the past but um, are no longer using it uh, currently, then you might want to check in again and see that the edit box has changed. So we'll call this one sample form, and then you can pick all these beautiful, um, all these beautiful templates. There are usually a lot more templates than this, and uh, the Google rumor mill has says that they're going to release more soon. But for right now, uh, this is a pretty good start. So we'll go ahead, and I'm feeling fishy today, so we'll go to this fish. Um, and uh, then what I'm going to do is uh, put in my first question. So if this was an assessment, I probably want my kids to put in their name. I like to separate it by last name and then first name so that I could, uh, this comes out in a spreadsheet format, and that way I can alphabetize their responses. You could see that you, can, uh, you have a myriad of options for the question type. Uh, since this is their name and I want them to be able to type it, I'm going to put in text. And I'm going to make that a required question so they cannot turn in the form without putting in their name. So then I'm going to do last name, and then I'm going to add another item, and I'm going to do first name, make that required too. Um, you see here I forgot to write the word name. So if, that, if I forget something or want to edit it, I can come over here to the pencil and fix it, and then click done. And then I'm going to go ahead, and this time I'm going to put in your home room number, because I was always departmentalized. And I want to know which homeroom they're in. So I could say room 311, 312, or 313. Um, this is the help text that comes up underneath the question in gray. So I could say the first class you go to. And I'm going to make this required too. I could go on and add more questions like check boxes. I could do more, um, fill in the blank, or I'm sorry, um, paragraph text for an essay question, choose from a list. 
um, scale is nice, so like from a scale from one to five, how do you feel today, or a grid where they have to check things off in a grid. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick uh, checkbox, and I'll say, check off how you feel today. And we do this a lot for our mood check-ins. So I'll say happy, sad, mad. And we normally have many more options than that, but we'll leave it off. At the bottom, the confirmation message is what the kids see when they submit. And I'll say, thanks for letting us know how you feel today. Um, publish link is going to show them what everyone else has responded. Allow at responders to edit responses after submitting is going to allow them to go back and fix any mistakes they might have. But once they navigate away from that link, they won't be able to change it again. So make sure once they submit, they're really sure about what they did. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click Choose Response Destination now, because that's going to tell my form where to put all of the data once users are submitting this form. So the thing that most people are going to do is create a new spreadsheet. It's going to create almost like an Excel-looking spreadsheet that's going to input all the responses. New sheet in an existing spreadsheet would add um, another tab to the bottom of an old spreadsheet that you've already created. Um, and keeping responses only in forms is if you have a ton of responses. If you are in a huge company and you are getting over 100,000 people responding, you probably want to do it this way because forms can only save, I believe it's about 100,000 cells. So be sure um, you, you uh, use that if you have a ton of responses. For those of us who are classroom teachers or working in schools, you probably will never exceed 100,000, so you're going to just create a new spreadsheet. Once you hit Create, you can see it's setting up the spreadsheet. I can view my form up here and see what it looks like. There's my beautiful fishies. Um, or I could email the form directly to students. I could share the link through Facebook, Twitter, or Google+. Or I could even embed it into a web page by copying this embed code and putting it into my website, be it a Google site, um, a blogger, a WordPress, a kid blog, um, a Google site, Weebly, anything um, you might want to do. So what I usually do is I embed it in a site or I share this link. And then you can see it's really simple. So I'm going to click on View Responses. And I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like when I create the form or fill it out. So I can be a student. I'll say my last name is Nagara Jenny. I, I'm in 313, and today I'm both happy and sad. because I'm happy because I'm in a webinar about Google, but I'm sad because it's my last webinar with McGraw-Hill of this series. I hit Submit, and instantly, da 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 if your internet was faster, there it goes. It immediately shows up. You can see I have my little uh, message that I wrote. And if the kids need to, they can click edit the response to fix any of their answers. Um, now I want to show you something else that's really fun to do. You can do conditional formatting. Let's say I want to know immediately, just by glancing at my uh, screen, if anyone is mad. I could type in text contains mad. And I can say to turn the background a color that's going to jump out at me. And I'll pick this uh, red color. I could also say if they're sad, then I want it to turn like a blue color. Um, I can change that to text does not contain, if it's empty, if it's greater or less than, if it's a math problem. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and hit Save Rules. And now if I go ahead and I put I am, let's be Danielle today. Um, sorry, Danielle, we're going to make you angry. And we're going to say that she's mad. And we'll hit submit. That's OK. I, I can do that. I get that when I'm in room 311. OK. And look, oh no, Danielle's mad. So now as I skim through my 35 homeroom students, um, I can just see color coded how people are feeling. So this is a mood check-in, but imagine doing this for an assessment where you can look and say, how many kids got the right answer? How many kids got the, um, the miscue? So for that real-time differentiation, it's really powerful. Danielle, are you guys using Google Forms in your classrooms at all? Yeah, I use Google Forms a lot and in a bunch of different ways. Um, instructionally speaking, I use I love the little button at the, the bottom of the um, edit form that allows students to view published response view the published responses of others. Um, and I also like the edit, allow them to edit their answers. So sometimes when we're working with a new concept in my language arts classes, I'll make a little form that would be the test, normally would be a formative test, but I'll allow them to um, 
go ahead and put their answers in and then go review everyone else's answers. And then if they want to go back and change theirs because they see one they like better, they can go change it. Um, and they can keep doing that until we all come up with the same answer. And it's sort of a gentle, introspective, quiet way for them to learn. Um, I also use it, as you said, for t to see right away who's got the right answer and who's got the wrong answer just on their own without the edit button, um, without being able to look at each other's responses. And I've also put Google Forms in the hands of my students. Right now, for instance, my seniors in my senior research class are doing independent research. And so they are making pretty extensive surveys that they're distributing to their friends, to fellow students, to teachers, to parents, and they're using that data um, to do their research projects about different things. They're checking out the efficacy of our tutoring program. They're seeing how many extracurriculars are too many, et cetera, and they're using Google Forms to do it. Um, I also use Google Forms when I'm running professional development for my faculty members as a quick way to see um, how to put them in groups that will work for them, either by interest or by their sort of ability levels. So I use Google Forms, I would say, at least once a day. Yeah, they, I, I think that there can be days where I just have like a million forms going. It's such a useful tool. It's even great, like you said, to do in PD. Um, Don had a great question. She said, how does that work if they're doing an essay? Now, you can do a, a longer response for a form, so let's show you how to do that. From this view, if I'm in the spreadsheet, if I click on form and go to edit form, I'm able to edit my form. So let's say I want to add another item and I want them to explain why they're feeling that way. So why are you feeling this way? And then I can do paragraph text and I hit done. If I come over here and refresh it, you'll see that they have this whole paragraph box to write. There's still a character limit. Um, you can get a, a good juicy amount of writing here, but if you wanted them to write like a full, you know, three to five paragraph plus essay, you probably want to use Google Docs, which uh, actually takes us back to our presentation. Good segue. Thanks, Don. And we're going to talk about Google Docs for collaboration. So Google Docs is um, an amoebic term. People use Google Docs for almost any of the creative file types that you can create in Google Drive. People call Google Forms Google Docs. Google Presentations, Google Docs. Um, however, when you click on the Create, you can see that um, while all of these are Google Docs, um, Google Docs can also refer specifically to Google Documents. So for those of you who speak Microsoft Office, a Google Document is akin to uh, a Word doc. Presentation is like a PowerPoint. Spreadsheet is like an Excel spreadsheet. Form is unique and of itself. And drawing is uh, like Microsoft Paints. Um, Pixorial video here, this is another third-party app that I've downloaded uh, that we could talk about later. It's more like iMovie, um, but that is not owned directly by Google. So let's go ahead and look at a Google document. And what I really love about this is how powerful it is. Now, um, Danielle can't really see, but I'm still going, uh, she just had um, eye surgery, but I'm still going to share this with her to show you what it looks like. So if I click on share, I can, um, oops, first I need to title it, so I'll call this McGraw-Hill test doc, and I'll save it. Um, now I'm going to share it with her, and I'm going to put in her name. Oops, you know what? I don't think I have her email address saved in this account. Danielle, do you have an uh, email address I can share this to? Oh, her mic yeah, might be um, oh, go ahead. why don't you do it to my work address? It's F. Uh, it's uh, F I L A S. Uh huh. D as in Darling Danielle, <laughs> at villageacademy.org. All right, so um, now when you share it with somebody, note that you have some options here. Edit means she's going to be able to type all in this thing. Um, she can't really see, so I don't expect her to write a lot, but if she, if she is able to open it, she can just jam on the keyboard and make a bunch of stuff. <laughs> she could comment on it. Um, like give me feedback and say, hey, this is great, or hey, you need to work on that. Or she could just view on it. She can't actually say anything about it, but she could take a look and see it as an exemplar. I'm going to give her full editing privileges. Sending a copy to myself um, 
will send an email to me so I can see that she got it. I can add a message like, behold, this amazing document. Wow. Um, I can paste the actual doc into the email, which right now is going to be pretty silly because there's nothing on the doc, but I'll do it anyway. Um, and then I can go ahead and share it. Note also that the overall doc settings right now are private. Only the people listed can see it. I can change it so that I can have different share settings. And this is the link to share. Oh, so wow, she can, she can kind of see. So she's typing. Um, look at her. She knows her, uh, her home keys. <laughs> so she's typing, and I can write back and be like, you're so amazing. And right now, where I have my black cursor, she actually probably sees a colored cursor that says Jenny McGarra, or actually AUSL demo, because that's the name of the account I'm in. Now, here's where it gets super cool. So if I have kids who are collaborating, like Danielle and I are doing right now, I can um, highlight and insert comments. So I can click on this little guy right here, and I can insert a comment. I can say, what? Oops. What? Why are you blind? And hit comment. Um, and then she could click on this and reply to my comment. Um, she could make her own comment. Um, so it, what's, and what's really nice about this is as we're going through and adding comments, we get email notifications. So as I comment on it or as she comments on it, we're eventually, after about five minutes, see, there we go. My eyes are going to be bionic, and I can write that downright impressive. So we're having a little dialogue to the side here. I can also see all comments in the entire doc up here. I can see the text. And this is what the email to me will look like. It'll tell me the time. It'll give me the selected text that the conversation is regarding. And then it will have the comments and any replies. And it will send it directly to my email. And I can reply to the comments from my email, and it will add it to this comment stream down here. So it's really great for kids to uh, co-collaborate on a document, on writing, on a project. It's also super awesome for lesson plans when teachers are collaborating to write a unit. Um, so while you know people talk about Google Docs and the collaborative nature, but not a lot of people um, realize how cool the commenting feature is. You think about track changes and, um, in, Word, in Microsoft Word, but this is so much more powerful. Speaking of track changes, if you want to see what happened, let's say I accidentally do this. Oh, no! Danielle, I deleted the entire document. What are we going to do? How could you? How could you? That was Shakespearean in quality. Oh, well, not to fear. File, see revision history is here. So I click on this, and now you can see in this right nav bar, I can see every single revision that happened throughout the history of this document, and I can even restore it so that version. If I don't see enough versions, I can cl click down here and see more or fewer changes. Um, so that's always an option. Um, the past is always saved. What happens in Google Docs uh, stays in Google Docs. <laughs> you can always come back and check it out. Um, Danielle, do you want to add anything about the power of Docs and how it rocks your world? It totally rocks my world. Um, I've used it in so many ways and the kids really love it. Um, I just gave it to one of my lower school teachers uh, whose students are just learning to type. And so she had them, and we actually did this with a parent workshop too, we had them write in, uh, see who could be the first person to write the quick brown dog jumped over, or the fox jumped over the lazy dog to see who could be first to finish the sentence. So they're all erasing and typing and got to be a big madhouse. So there are little fun ways you can use it like that. Um, since I've been out of school for a couple of days um, because of my eyes, it's been really easy for me to communicate with my subs and to work with my students even though I'm home. Um, and I have a feeling you might be showing them some text-to-speech dealies too later, Jenny, that, <laughs> that can be useful for my uh, my particular situation. But my students Absolutely. also really like it for peer reviewing each other's work. Um, I can set, uh, I think you'll probably show the doc to put us off later too, I can set some sharing privileges to allow students to share and peer review in groups with one another. And I can actually look in on their reviewing as it's going on. Um, or as students are working in groups, I can be sitting at my desk and just drop into their document and say, hey, I really like this point you're making. Uh, have you tried researching that online to make sure your, your facts are correct? 
um, and they get super excited when you're dropped into their assignment. So it's like you can sit in on all of your students' groups at once uh, without being intrusive um, and without kind of embarrassing them by hovering around them. Um, oh, I, I love that. I love that big brother. I love having all 30 kids' doc tabs open in my window and seeing keystroke for keystroke what they're all doing. Exactly. Um, I also had my students do a long-term editing um, uh, assignment for our novels that we're writing, and I was able to use the track revision to go and see how many hours they devoted to editing. Um, when parents would say, oh, he worked for eight hours on this assignment, I could pop in and go, mm, he had it open for eight hours, but he didn't write anything, uh, <laughs> because you can see it uh, if you want to go totally big brother on it. Um, or you can show a parent whose students may be struggling with grammar, you know, it doesn't look like she did a lot, but she really <laughs> worked hard. Look how much better it is than when she started and look at all the hours she devoted. So yeah. it's a super powerful tool, um, and it's so much easier with communicating with your colleagues. You don't have to fuss with different drafts and things like that. If you make a silly little mistake on a presentation or on a document, you can just fix it, and it's fixed live for every Everybody, nobody has to know your dirty little secret. Oh my God, I, I love that, and I love. Um, I'm, I'm presenting with some colleagues in Atlanta, and we're using Prezi, which is online collaboration tool. But I keep thinking, oh, I wish we were using uh, a Google presentation because it would be so much easier to real time edit. Um, I also want to show. Uh, Don had a great question. She said, "Can you turn off the notifications? Because that could get annoying." So if you click up here on comments, then you can click on notification settings, and you can enable or disable email notifications and determine when you get each of them, which is really nice. All right, so we'll come back to docs later as we're talking about other things. But now let's move on, and we're going to talk about a script to talk about workflow. So um, some teachers were asking about how do I, Heidi asked, how do I organize my folders and so that they all go to the right place? And the best thing for this is a script. If you don't know what a Google script is, it installs into a Google spreadsheet. So when you have a spreadsheet like this one, and you go to Insert, and at the bottom you'll see Scripts, there's a script gallery. And these are tons of scripts that um, smart uh, boys and girls have created, and by boys and girls I mean full-size boys and girls, although um, some children might have also done some of these. But one especially awesome guy, Andrew Stillman, has created a bevy of educational scripts to make uh, the spreadsheets work better. So that's basically what a, sp a script does. It, it, it enhances a spreadsheet and makes it even more awesome than it already is. Doctopus is my favorite current one, um, and the reason being is because it is the virtual photocopier for uh, any Google Doc. So imagine that I want to create a Google Doc like this, but I'm going to make this my um, role of thunder, hear my cry, discussion guide. And I'm going to put um, a table in here with some questions. So I'll put question one, answer, and so on. Question two, and answer and continue and create this almost like a template that I want them to type their thinking into. Now I don't want to create this a hundred times, I just want to copy this so that everyone gets their own. I'm also concerned because um, if you saw when you click share, it can get a little bit confusing about how to share. And um, Normally when a kid creates a doc, they have to share it back with you. Did they share it correctly? What if a kid deletes it from their drive and then you can't see it anymore? Oh no, lots of concerns. Well, the beautiful thing with Doctopus is it allows you to take a roster of students. So I can take a roster like this one. Da, da, da. Well, let's see if I have a demo roster in here. Here we go. I have a roster like this one, and let's pretend this is my class. Um, and I need to have their names in one column, their email addresses in another, and if I want to differentiate, I could put their student group names in this one. And it doesn't have to be A, B, it's C, it could be, you know, Bluebirds, Ravens, whatever. Um, and then uh, put them into groups. And then all I have to do is run the Doctopus script, and it will share out um, this spreadsheet or this uh, document or a presentation or a spreadsheet or whatever I want with every child in my class, title it, put it into a folder, give me ownership rights so they can't delete it, and it will even allow me to do a rubric. Um, 
which is called rubric, which is this little guy right here, and it will allow me to grade their work using that rubric. So let me show you really quickly um, one example, because I believe that I have some. Here we go. So if I click here, this was uh, something I did for another presentation. If I click on the rubric guy, I've already attached a rubric to this. And then you can see that I have all these options. So I could type in here you know, that they got a 0, a 1, a 2, and it will um, highlight that box and then email them their grade. Um, it adds all that information to um, the spreadsheet and keeps track of it for later, uh, for later use. We're not actually going to go through the Doctopus uh, script or the Gubrick script step by step to show you how to do it right now for a couple of reasons. One being it's 27 past the hour, and we're only gotten through number three, so we're going to pick up our pace here. And two, because um, it, it takes a little, little bit to show you how. Once you've done it once or twice, it's really easy. If you want to learn more about it, I suggest going to UPD slash Doctopus. Um, that's Y-O-U-P-D, like you and me, Y-O-U-P-D dot org slash Doctopus, which is just octopus with a D. And that's Andrew Stillman, the script creator's website, and he has a walkthrough and some information on it there. Um, and then I actually have some more information um, as to where to find more uh, scripts uh, tutorials, and that's at Jay Atwood's, um, Jay Atwood's, uh, sorry, I'm trying to type and talk at the same time, and I'm not good at that, website. And that is sandbox.atwoodphoto.com. Um, and that, this is a great website that Jay Atwood, who's another Google certified teacher and another all around awesome guy, um, has created to help you get some uh, script help that's a little bit more user friendly than maybe um, Andrew Stillman. So I'll just go ahead and paste that right there for you so you can see it in larger text. Um, Danielle, I'm going to forego chatting with you about Doctopus just for this one. We can maybe come back to it to save time, uh, if that's okay with you. Totally fine. But, and then we're going to go on to Google Sites for new portfolios. Um, we're going to do this one really quick because I want to talk more about extensions, and I think Danielle has some fun ones to share too. So for those of you who haven't seen Google Sites, it's a free website creator from Google. Um, it's really uh, great to create for a number of things. One thing that I've done is create it for my presentations. So you can see I've created a little website for you to get some uh, information. Um, and all you need to do to create your Google site is to go to sites.google.com and you can click Create. And it takes you through a template uh, walkthrough and it shows you exactly what to do. One thing I would suggest is not using the classroom site or you know, wedding site, anything like that. Just start with the blank template and add your own elements. Because when you start with someone else's template, they're never going to be exactly what you want. And you're going to spend more time deleting and fixing the template than it would be just to create it from scratch. There's tons of videos on YouTube. I have some on my site to walk through that you can um, have the video up and have your screen up and click along with the narrator. Um, but I find that if you just go through it in a blank template, you'll be a lot less confused. Um, people are using Google Sites uh, as digital resumes or um, presentation shares like this, all the way to um, class digital portfolios and learning management systems like this one that I had for my class uh, in the years past. So you can see I have my class calendar embedded. I have my exit ticket form. That's the Google form that I was showing you before. Um, I have links to our student work, um, a contact form. So lots of things to um, have the kids interact with the content in the school. Um, so that's Google Sites. And again, um, Danielle, I'm going to skip past uh, chatting this, and we can do one big comment when we get to extensions, because then we'll be on track. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is Google Extensions. And this is where we're going to slow down a little bit, because this is where your life can change. An extension is um, an add-on to make your browsing experience better, and it works only with your Google Chrome browser. So if you're using Safari or Internet Explorer or, Google, or um, Mozilla Firefox, stop it and switch to Google Chrome because Chrome um, can and will change your life. And I'm not just saying this because I love me some Google. Um, so now we're going to slow down a bit. And Danielle, what is your favorite Chrome extension? Oh, I have to pick a favorite. It's like Sophie's oh, Choice or something. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to sidestep that by saying that 
it may not be my favorite, but it's the one I use the most. And it's the Google shortener. It's G-O-O-G-L. Um, and I love this little thing because usually I, I find myself having to share my site and other people's sites and all kinds of web addresses. Um, and I need to be able to do it quickly. Um, and, with, and, and usually you have to go to a whole site and paste in the URL and then hit a button and have it um, come back out uh, as a short URL. Uh, but uh, the G, uh, that looks like a different one than the one I'm using, I think. Uh, yeah. The goo.gl is a URL shortener that just lives in your um, extension, uh, lives in your web browser. And when you click it, it not only instantly, yeah, that's the one, that's the stuff. Uh, it not only instantly provides you a short URL, uh, but it can also instantly provide you a QR code um, that you can just right click and paste wherever you want to. So I love that. I use it all the time so my students aren't wasting time taping down long um, annoying. Yeah, there's your little guy. See a little green guy sitting there in the right corner. So it's, it's so I agree. I, I love these. Um, so for example, someone in the questions just asked, do we have access to your website for additional resources? And I could say, yes, go to blah, 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 this whole long URL. Or I can click on this little guy. And now here's a quick short little, um, and I can just send that to everybody in the uh, answers and questions and answers. Now all of you have a, a nice quick link and you saw as Danielle said, I also can get a QR code if you want to scan it. I think this one's similar. Oh no, this is the wrong one. You're right, it is this one. This is the shortcuts to all the Google goodness. Which is also um, awesome. <laughs> the way that we got to that is we went to our Chrome Web Store and to get there you open a new window. That's what this little parallelogram is right here. Um, and then I click on Chrome Web Store and then I can either browse by category, or if I know what I'm looking for, I can type it in right here. And I'm going to actually type in one of my favorites, which is Evernote Clearly. Not every note clearly, Evernote Clearly. And um, make sure at the top there's all apps, extensions, and themes. If you know it's an extension, click on that. Then you add it to Chrome. Most apps and extensions are free. There are a handful that cost money, but the majority are free, which is another reason I love them. Now, let's say I was going to New York Times, and I want my kids to read um, an article here. The problem with uh, reading these is that while the text is rich and it's great and authentic, you never know what's going to show up on the screen. You don't know if there's going to be some inappropriate ad, and not that New York Times would have something completely inappropriate, but perhaps distracting. So let's say I want them to uh, read this article on schools put college dreams into practice, which actually looks like a great article to read with my kids. Um, go figure. And I'm concerned. I don't want them to look at this dessert, this dessert ad and this Chromebook ad right here that um, has like flash going on. It's, it's a little bit distracting. So if I click on Evernote clearly, it takes that article and it takes out all that other gob nonsense and it just has the text and the media from the article, which is beautiful. If your kids have Evernote accounts, they can additionally highlight and annotate the text. Um, you can see you need to sign in to do that and then save that to their Evernote account. So that's another awesome extension. We could go on all day about Chrome apps and extensions. Um, but I just want to share one more, and actually I'm going to install it while Danielle talks about it. I don't know which one you use, Danielle, but I use Announceify. Have you mm -hmm. used this one? I just started playing with so that. <laughs> so do you want to tell them why it's so appropriate for you right now? <laughs> if you should have to have eye surgery. <laughs> um, but it's an extension that allows you to do, to say that it takes text to talk is probably way too simple. Um, but it re basically it reads out loud pretty much any kind of document or website or any text that you uh, need to have read to you. Um, for me right now it's great because I'm able to actually not have to squint at, with my bleary eyes at the screen to hear my students' emails or the Google Docs that I shared with them, uh, the, the notes from parents, that sort of thing. Uh, and you can do it on your phone, which is also pretty nifty. I don't know if you've used that yet. 
Jenny. I haven't. That's good to know. So let's let's play with that real quick. So here's that article. And now let's click on our little Announcify bird. Undefined. Oops, where, where's he going? <laughs> there we go. Along his block in New York's West Ward, where drugs are endemic and the young residents talk about shootings with alarming nonchalance, Naji Little is known as the smart kid. All right, so you get it. So it's a, it's a pretty cool tool that allows your kids to get um, text-to-speech in a really easy way. There's a couple other ones that are out there and a few that allow you to um, mess with rate and accents. So definitely check it out. Yeah, I really like oh, Sound oh. Gecko too. I don't know if you've used that one. I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but it's on my long list of things when I get a free minute, hypothetically, ha-ha, <laughs> <laughs> to play with. I like it because right. it sounds a little more natural. So everyone put that on your to-do list, sound gecko, and then write back and tell us what you think. Um, Robert wants us to remind you that the goo.gl, goo.gl shortcuts are case sensitive, which is really important. So the T in the link that I sent out has to be a capital T, um, and you need to make sure that you keep it tap, uh, capital. Um, so the next thing that we want to talk to you about is Google Groups for PLCs. And I, I've been using Google Groups for a long time, but only really recently did I realize how awesome they are um, for, for getting a group of people to streamline their communication and collaboration. Now, if you haven't used Google Groups, it's basically just Gmail on steroids. So um, what you can do is create a group, and I can call this group McGraw-Hill, um, Ed, uh, let's say, Webinar um, Team Awesome. I can call this, this is for all the amazing people out there. Um, and then I can hit create. I have to do this silly thing that I can never do. Please hold. I'm probably going to get it wrong. This verify. See, I can never do this word very, and I have full um, access to my eyesight, and I can never do it. All right, let's try that one. Word verification. All right, I did it. So now I can invite people to join my group. I can enter email addresses here um, and send invites, or I can share it for you and have you request to invite. Um, so if I clicked on join request, I can see anyone who is pending and um, approve them. However, once they are in, um, it basically asks as an email listserv. So uh, anyone who emails the address, uh, whatever it was, mhwebinarawesometeam at googlegroups.com, it goes to the entire listserv uh, recipients. People can respond to it. We can tag our posts um, if we do it through this platform, and we can see everything that anyone has said. So it's really helpful for PLCs. So we run a ton of PLCs at our schools. And we use Google Groups to communicate because then instead of saying, hey, I know Danielle sent me this uh, great email about um, you know, performing arts in school, I can just go to my Google Group and it's all archived in one place together. I don't have to worry about labels or folders or stars. Um, and they're even tagged by subject. Uh, do you use Google Groups at all? I do. Um, I use it um, in school and also with uh, some theater groups that I work with. My students have started using it for their clubs and orgs as well. Um, and they especially like that it's a really quick way to add calendar events for everybody um, in their groups and to get Google Hangouts set up and things like that. Um, so I think that if you're trying to figure out, you know, why might I need to use one thing versus something else, uh, this is just like a better archive. Carol wants us to clarify uh, PLC isn't an acronym that everyone uses. Some people call it PLN. Some people call it something completely different. It's Professional Learning Community. So it's a group of educators or professionals who meet together to grow professionally um, by discussing topics and problems of practice. So we might meet as a math team and discuss math curricula, um, student work, data, common core um, integration, things like that. The next thing um, that we want to share with you are Google Hangouts for meetings. And if you have never been on a Google Hangout, again, do it. 
It's amazing. Um, for those of you who have never done it before, I have a Google Hangouts. Um, uh, let me get this here real quick. I have a little uh, tip sheet for you that I created with some fellow um, Google certified teachers. I just sent it to all of you. Uh, tinyurl.com slash Google Hangout tips. And it's a Google Doc with some information about how to start up your first Google Hangout. You need to activate your Google Plus account. You need to download a, a voice and chat a video and voice plugin. Um, and there's just some quick tips. Now, I'm not actually going to start a Google Hangout, but I'm going to pretend to. So I'm going to go to my Google Plus account here. And then I am going, oh, see, I haven't even set up my account. So this is actually what you're going to need to do. So you'll skip that. And then here's my accounts. And then right up here, I can click Start a Hangout. Let's try that again. I think it might have, oh, there it is back here. I popped up 100 windows. And then I could, um, I actually don't, let's, this will be interesting to see if it lets me do it. But I'm going to try and hang out. Oh, there you can see me down at the bottom. Hi, there I am. So I can go ahead and put in a name. So I'm going to invite myself, actually. Um, You're going to blow up Google. <laughs> I am going to blow up Google. I'm going to break Google right now. And I'm actually going to turn off my camera because I don't like my hair today. I'm going to call this Blow Up Google Hangouts. And Hangouts on Air means it's broadcasting on YouTube. But we're not going to do that. If I click Hangout, who knows what's going to happen. Holy cow. Oh, it totally let me. <laughs> so you can hear that um, it gives you a really loud ringtone. And I'm going to hang up on myself here. I'm going to say no, ignore. But once we're in the Hangout, you can see that you can do a ton of cool things. I can invite more people. I can have a chat with them. I can even share my screen. Oh, let's get, let's get Inception here. Whoa, so now you can see my screen within a screen. Oops, let's click on this again. So here, um, you could, if this was on, you could see all my screens so Danielle could see what I'm doing. I could do some silly Google effects, like put a hat on or be completely ridiculous. I could um, put in a YouTube video, and we could all watch it together, but I would be pausing and uh, starting and stopping it to discuss something. I could add a document from my Google Drive. Slowly but surely, this is what happens when you're on um, less than amazing internet. Okay, and then I could pick a doc. So here's that doc we were playing with before. And so if I invited Danielle to my Hangout, she could join and we could all be typing in here together. And I could look at her beautiful face down here. And she wouldn't be able to see me because she's blind right now. But I could tell her that my hair looks good and that would be a lie. Um, and in a, in a Google education or business account, you can have up to 15 people in a Hangout. So for those of you who are like, oh, it's just Skype. Well, the screen sharing you can't do in Skype. The adding a Google Doc you can't do in Skype. The let's read a let's watch a YouTube video you can't do. And you certainly, unless you're going to pay for a premium Skype, can't have 15 people in it. So that's pretty awesome. There's also other apps that you can um, add. Some of them are silly, like Ping Pong Hangout and play ping pong. Um, and some of them are and some of them are games like War Light is a strategy game. I really like this one for those of you who travel a lot and have small bitty babies. A story before bed lets you read a story to your kids and turn the pages for them while they're on the other side of the hangout. Symphonical is a task management tool. So lots of really cool things that you can do. And I work in 25 Chicago public schools all across the Chicagoland area. So I t I find myself doing Google Hangouts a ton to meet with people because I cannot get from one side of the city to another um, unless I've been the time-space continuum and the time it takes to get to their meeting. But I found that uh, colleagues who even work in the same building like to do Google Hangouts because, you know, Miss, uh, Miss McGarra might need to get home and pick up a three-year-old before she gets charged extra for daycare, but we need to co-plan. So I'll go home, pick up my kid, get them some dinner in them, put them to bed, and then we can meet at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night over Google Hangout on our couches with a glass of Kool-Aid or adult Kool-Aid um, and do that planning. But it's sometimes even more efficient because we're here, we're looking at our screen, we can all see the same thing. Um, Danielle, what do you think? How are you using Hangouts? Oh my gosh, love Google Hangout. You can also use it um, on your phone. You can actually hang out from your phone. I didn't make it home in time for a Google Hangout and thought, well, I'll just try it on my phone and it worked great. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, not all of the 
the um, extensions like the docs um, didn't work on my on my phone but uh, um, but but you can still do it um, when a student is absent if they're missing something important I've had them Google hang out with us before so they could actually attend class and my kids are using it as a um, study group aid as well they're all so busy but they want to study together so they use hangouts but you should know that um, it requires a Google Plus account and students have to be 13 years or older in order to use the Google Plus account. Uh, we had some trouble with students clicking, nope, I'm not 13, and then they got shut out of their Google account entirely. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so make sure that you're only using it with the older students. But we've used it a ton. I've even hung out with myself. That sounds really sad, uh, but hung out with myself <laughs> on air. Uh, but it's not sad. It's actually really brilliant because it recorded my session on YouTube, so it's a really quick way to flip a lesson uh, without having to mess around with a bunch of other software. I also, um, I'm also showing um, at the bottom here, uh, this is, I'm going to turn off the sound on this video, this is a hangout that we did between two schools in our district that are about two or three miles apart, but really different demographic, and we were discussing um, a, a video uh, uh, news article that we saw, and so you can see the kids are, are talking to each other. These uh, these six students are mine, and then this is a group of fourth graders from the north side of Chicago, um, and you can see them all, you know, having this conversation and going back and forth and chatting about it. Um, and it was really interesting to see them talk to each other and um, hear their different feedback. And then what we did was screencast this to capture their metacognition. So lots of really cool ways to use Google Hangouts. Really transformative. Um, well, the, I think it's one of the best free, it, I, at least in my opinion, it's the best free um, screen uh, con or video conferencing software out there, espe Hands especially down. with the word free. <laughs> um, but the next thing we want to show you guys is Google Calendar for school events. We'll go through this really quickly because it might seem kind of like a duh moment, like of course Google Calendar for school events. But for those of you who um, aren't using Google Calendar, you might not realize some of the features that it has that's really neat. So um, on the left here, you can see I have multiple um, boxes. I have a uh, demo, I have tasks, I have context birthdays and US holidays. So I can click and unclick these, and it show, hides and shows them. Um, so I can unclick and click, and it shows them. So it, where this becomes really powerful is imagine instead of this saying AUSL demo and tasks, it said fourth grade literacy, fifth grade literacy, sixth grade literacy, seventh grade math. And I could click or unclick and then layer on top of them um, the, the different units of study that were being taught. And so I could see vertical alignments on, you know, I could see on Monday, oh my gosh, look, three different grades are teaching um, volume at different levels. That's a really great opportunity for a school-wide integrated unit. Or I might see that the art teacher is teaching about Picasso. And wow, that might be great to think about shapes and geometry in my math class so we could do a cross-subject integrated unit. Um, and then there's the obvious of, you know, we could put school events and deadlines for teachers and to-dos and things like that on the calendar as well. But one thing I really want to show you that um, was saved, it was on the chopping block. And at the 11th hour, it was saved, which was really powerful, is calendar appointment slots. And this save, solves the age-old issue of, I want to meet with Danielle and my friend Jeff. I think Jeff's on here, actually. Jeff Herb. Yeah, he is. So I want to talk to Instructional Tech Talk, my friend Jeff, um, and Danielle. And um, I've never used calendar in this, in this one. Um, and I want to create an appointment. And I know that um, I want to meet with them sometime tomorrow, but I don't know when they're free. So I can just click on tomorrow, and I can click on appointment slots. And what I can do is I can say that this is called uh, Ed Tech Chat. And I could give this a time block of, you know, until noon. And I'm going to say these are going to be 45-minute appointments. This is going to be in my office. I could put in a description here. Um, and then I'm going to invite Danielle and Jeff. So I'm going to do Phyllis at villageacademy.org, and then I'm actually going to invite another person. I'm going to invite um, myself, uh, my other AUSL accounts, and then I'm going to hit save. 
And now it has um, this option. There's appointment slots where people can choose an appointment. So if I go back to um, another, and what I'm doing right here, this is multi-sign-in in Chrome. It's a user option, um, which we could talk to you about at another time. Um, I can go into another user account and take, check it out, and I can see I have this EdTech chat, and I can click on the different options, and I could pick um, when I'm going to be able to do that or not do it, etc. So again, what that looks like is I would click on appointment slots. Um, I could drag, I would click on the timing that I would want it, and then click appointment slots. I would say Ed Tech, and then I could invite people, and I can create the slots, and then people can choose their slots from within it. Um, really cool tool, re saves a lot of time, makes life a lot easier. Have you guys been using appointment slots? Yeah, in fact, one of the ways that it sort of saved our bacon is we you now use it to do parent-teacher conferences. So we actually post the appointment slots during parent-teacher conferences on our Google sites, because each of our teachers has a Google site. And then we tell our parents to go ahead and sign up. And so it's awesome, because we can just share that with our um, the, the woman who uh, she's called a secretary, but she's, she's more like our guru. Uh, but she can kind of help to send people in the right direction when they get there. Parents can choose their own times and cancel their own times. It's a pretty powerful way to do parent-teacher conferences. We went from sign-up sheets stuck on a wall with thumbtacks to that. So it's much wow. better. Yeah. <laughs> That's completely crazy. <laughs> um, so calendar, it seems like a simple tool, but it's actually pretty amazing. Um, it's also really great because in calendar you can invite someone to a hangout. So let's say that I wanted to have a hangout um, tomorrow, and I wanted to have it at 4 o'clock. Um, and uh, Danielle, actually you're in Ohio, right? So you're in a different time zone than I am. I am. So I want to make sure that she knows that at Central Time I can pick my time zone. So it'll show up as 5 o'clock for her, and I can say, awesome time, Hangout. And then I can click down here, add a Google Hangout. And so when I add Danielle to this, and I, um, when she clicks on it, she'll be able to just click on this Google Hangout when she wants to join. And we'll both click at 4 o'clock Central, 5 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be in it together rather than having to like actually manually invite her that day. So that's a really um, other great tool with Google Calendar. Um, the next thing we want to share with you guys is Google Drive for lesson plans. I'm going to go back to my AUSL account. Um, so I'm clicking on my little uh, avatar up here, and I'm going to pick the account I want to be in. And I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go to my Drive. Oops, I didn't type it in all the way. I could also click right here on Drive. Um, and then what I can do is um, show you one of my school's uh, Google Drive lesson plan folders. So Dodge School of Excellence is one of our schools. If I click on Dodge Curriculum, you can see all the different subjects that we have here. And then if I click on one of these, you can see all the teachers' names. Um, what's really great about this is it's easy for teachers to turn in lesson plans because when they're in their folder, all they need to do is click on Create and then Document. And they can just go ahead and write their lesson plan. But then you can also see when they last modified it, who the owner is. But the really cool thing about this is that um, when the teachers need feedback or support from their curriculum coach or their administrator, just like we talked about before, when you are um, working in a document, let's go ahead and just create a document. Um, and I, you know, we'll call this lesson plan. And then we'll just do lesson, blah, blah. So as I'm, um, you know, the curriculum instruction, the instructional coach and I'm reading this lesson plan, I might notice, hmm, this part looks kind of interesting. So I could say, what is the CCFS alignment for this? And then I hit comment. And in about five minutes, that teacher is going to get an email showing that I highlighted this part of her lesson, what I said, and if she clicks on the link, it'll take her directly to this part in the Google Doc. So this isn't a ton right now, but let's say the doc was really long. It was all the way down here, and I just wanted to comment on this piece all the way down here, and I could say, please add more detail. Normally, you would give them that feedback by sending them an email or putting a post-it note on it, and then the teacher has to find where in their lesson plan are you talking about. However, in this case, the teacher, when they get their link um, to this comment, they're going to click on it, and it's going to automatically zoom down in the document to right here, 
and then highlight this yellow so I can see what are you talking about, when did you say it, what's your comment, and I can reply back to it and said, I added more detail, please check. What's also great about this on the administrative and teacher level is I can have see a record of feedback and support over time. I can see what are, what's my principal or uh, curriculum support coach telling me. As the support coach, I can say, have I said this to this teacher before or not? Um, so just like you would do revisions in writer's workshop for students, it also helps teachers to grow and be better writers of lesson plans and curricula. Um, and saving it through Google Drive is so much more powerful than um, emailing it or even printing it out and putting it in the principal's um, mailbox because I can see uh, not only vertical alignments, but all these lesson plans are saved over time. They're archived, they're editable, and they're collaborative. Um, the final thing about bringing some of these tools together is then um, teachers are jumping into Google Hangouts to write these lesson plans together. So Danielle starts the lesson plan. She schedules an appointment and calendar with me for 4 o'clock tomorrow. We jump in together. She adds the doc and we're writing about it um, together and uh, creating it together in real time, um, which, is, which is just really cool. Every time I do it, I'm like, gosh, this is so gosh darn amazing. Um, Danielle, have you guys been using Drive uh, on a teacher level at all like this? Uh, we have. We've um, been slowly kind of handing out the Google Kool-Aid for everybody to drink, and more and more teachers are utilizing this tool. Um, it's a wonderful way for emergency sub plans. It's a, it's a wonderful way to archive. Uh, we used to have to back up our drive every day, and now it's just done. As soon as you type it in, it's backed up on Google Drive. I also like that you can store the same document in multiple folders so that you can have it a shared folder. You can have a folder that's just for you. There are all kinds of ways that you can archive what you have. Uh, to make it work for you, almost cross-referencing everything. Yeah, I love that. So the last thing that we want to share with the two minutes left are two more Google scripts to check out. We're going to leave you hanging here, but this one here with the donkey is called Formule. And what that does is it takes submissions from a Google form and it does things with them. So it would allow you, every time Jenny submitted a form, if I said something specific, it would send me an email using the information from here. So I could set this form so that it says, Dear, so it sends an automatic email. As soon as Jenny hits submit, it would say, Dear Jenny, I'm sorry that today when you were in 313, you were feeling happy and sad. I hope you feel better. Please email me back, Miss Magara. You know, Dear Danielle, I'm sorry that today in room 311, you are feeling mad. And it inserts this data from the form um, using the form mule. It can also uh, schedule calendar appointments as well. This other guy, Autocrat, creates a Google Doc, um, almost like a Mad Libs that inserts that form data into it. So it's not an email, it's actually a document that you can edit. Two more things to check out. If you want more information on it, I would suggest checking out um, that UPD website or um, Jay Atwood's website right here, sandbox.atwoodphoto.com, which has scripts, uh, walkthroughs, and videos on um, Doctopus, Formule, and Autocrat. So that's sandbox.atwoodphoto.com. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat right now. So when I go off of this, you can see it. So that'll do it for today. I think that Danielle and I could sit here and talk about Google all day, every day, until we were blue in the face, um, and we would actually be very happy to. Um, but we know all of you have places to get to. If you want to chat with us more, you can find me on Twitter at at Ms. Magara. If you go there and look at my profile, I also have a blog called Teaching Like It's $29.99 with videos, screencasts, and more Google tips. And you can find Danielle at at Ms. Phyllis, and you can also find a link to my blog, edunerd.blogspot.com. Quite possibly the best blog name ever. <laughs> well, that'll do it for us today, sports fans. We hope you had a beautiful April afternoon learning about Google with us. I am so sad to be leaving the McGraw-Hill webinar world for now. We hope you enjoyed this series. Um, and we hope you continue to push yourselves, innovate in your classrooms, and make teaching and learning better for your students. Have a great day, everyone.